looking serious in psychology. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of rules and admin stuff, and then I'm going to have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker for tonight. Um, so, for those of you who are here for extra credit for classes, after the talk and after we've gone through the question and answer section, there will be um, sheets in the back room. So if you go out this door and go to the right, there's a back room and there will be sign-up sheets for extra credit. Unless you're in Dr. Wong's classes, then you'll do it up here in front, okay? Um, so stay until the question and answer set part is over, and then you either go in the back door or you come up here in the front. If you can hear from continuous education, Dr. Lidquist is the person to talk to afterwards. Um, okay, so we're very excited um, to have Dr. Ryan Vandry here with us today. Um, and we appreciate for those of you who were able to kind of reschedule and come today because we were trying to do this a couple of weeks ago and we ran into some weather problems. Um, so Dr. Vandry is an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Um, and he received his PhD from University of Vermont in uh, experimental psychology. Um, he, today, he's going to talk to us about some of his research around cannabis, um, but in general, his research just focuses on the behavioral pharmacology of cannabis and nicotine and tobacco. So, please help me by welcoming Dr. Bailey. I'm going to try to project my voice. If you can't hear, you got to come closer. <laughs> um, this is amazing. So I usually don't get to talk in front of this many people, but I thought I was kind of really special or something here, but it turns out you guys are all just here for extra credit. <laughs> so um, that's okay. Keep me, peg me down a notch. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do, but also just changes in cannabis policy, regulation, and science generally. Um, so as Marie mentioned, I'm an experimental psychologist. I'm going to try to focus in on psychology. I think most people in here are psychology students. But I'm also going to weave in a bunch of other disciplines. So in my work, we do uh, bring in psychiatry, um, public health, toxicology, and a number of other disciplines as well. Um, but I am a psychologist by heart and training, so I'm going to try to focus in on that and speak to you guys as psychologists. Um, I have a requisite disclosure slide here. I do receive um, uh, consulting money and support from uh, industry, uh, but that really, I try to keep that as an educational thing that I give to the industry and I, I help people learn about what I do and, and about cannabis. Um, so I don't take money from people to tell you guys to use their products. Uh, so here's the outline of what we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to try to cover today. Talk a little bit about what cannabis is and what cannabinoids are. Uh, then go and talk a little bit about the social and political context uh, that's currently happening in the U.S. and as well as abroad. Uh, talk a little bit about cannabis and psychology and how we can use psychology to help advance what's happening here and, and advance our understanding in different aspects of cannabis science. Uh, and use that as a segue to talk a little bit about what I do in my lab and hopefully some of this will really get folks in this room energized about this topic and you guys will run off and do your own amazing things. Uh, so to begin with, I want to talk about what cannabis is. Uh, so cannabis is a plant and it's very complex. From a chemical standpoint, there are roughly a hundred different cannabinoid, uh, cannabinoids found in the plant. Cannabinoids are chemical entities that interact directly with the endocannabinoid system in our bodies. I'll talk a little bit about what those are. Um, it also has hundreds of other chemical entities that don't directly interact with the endocannabinoid system, but do have biological processes and physiological interactions with your body and can produce effects. Terpenoids, flavonoids are things that are representative of those other uh, ex uh, um, types of compounds. There are others as well, but these are the most predominant. Now these predominantly give flavor and uh, um, 
uh, uh, smell, fragrance uh, characteristics to the plant, uh, but again, they can have behavioral effects by themselves. So how cannabis acts as a drug, as I mentioned before, is it interacts with this endocannabinoid system in our bodies. Now there are two main cannabinoid receptors that have been identified, we call them CB1 and CB2 for ease. Um, and the CB1 receptor is the one that we most, uh, that we believe mitigates most of the effects that we associate with cannabis. This drives a lot of the uh, subjective drug effects, a lot of the high, a lot of the uh, potential health benefits. This is the receptor system that's it's predominant, uh, abundant in the central nervous system, so in your brain, in your spine, uh, and in your peripheral nervous system. CB2 receptor is also present in the central nervous system, but it's predominantly mostly localized in the periphery, um, in your immune system, in your gut. And these two receptors modulate different physiological uh, circuits or systems in your body. Now the cannabinoid compounds in the cannabis plant can directly interact with this and have a number of different effects. So this cartoon here is gonna uh, give you an example of what the process looks like here, and I'll try to walk you through this. So um, this is uh, um, a, a cartoon of a presynaptic receptor and a postsynaptic receptor and the synaptic cleft in the brain. Okay, and so if you know much about neurobiology, you know that these receptors communicate with each other through electrical pathways that are triggered by chemical signals. And so when a chemical signal is released from one receptor, it binds to receptors on the other, uh, or axon terminal binds to receptors on the other cell, and then <coughs> communication flows uh, forward. Now, uh, the two predominant neurotransmitters in the brain are GABA and glutamate that are excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. The endocannabinoid system is a presynaptic receptor um, that controls the release of neurotransmitters. And without cannabis, uh, there are endogenous ligands that are in our brain that are created on demand. Uh, 2-AG and anandamide are the two uh, most abundant uh, ones of these, and they are released by the postsynaptic cell back into the cleft, they bind the presynaptic cell, and activation of this, or agonism at this site, will inhibit release of this neurotransmitter no matter what it is. And so there are areas of the brain where you have high concentrations of these cannabinoid receptors, and uh, they're going to be specialized or localized to, um, to cells that release GABA or glutamate. But because these are inhibitory and excitatory neurotransmitters, they indirectly affect the release of other neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. So, what's the pharmacology? Is it all agonist? Is it all, what, what, is it, what do these cannabinoids do? And so we talked about there being about a hundred different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Um, I'm going to tell you just a little bit of a sampling of, of the variety of pharmacological effects that these cannabinoids can have. So our most predominant uh, cannabinoid in cannabis is THC, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. THC is a partial agonist at the CB1 receptor and the CB2 receptor. Most of the effects that we attribute to use of cannabis is directly mitigated by the effect of THC at the CB1 receptor. Now, partial agonism means that it activates the CB1 receptor, which means it's going to inhibit release of neurotransmitters. But being a partial agonist means there's, there's a ceiling on the effect that it can have in terms of pharmacology. So it can have dose-related increases to a point Beyond that point, you can keep escalating your dose and not have a greater pharmacological effect. In contrast to this, you may have heard of a number of synthetic cannabinoids that are becoming increasingly popular for recreational use. These products go under the names of K2, Spice, and things like that. A lot of the drugs that are found in those products are full agonists, which means that there's no ceiling on the types of effects they have. And that's why we see a lot of problems with people using too high of a dose for those products, and people show up to the ER with seizures, with convulsions, paranoia, hallucinations. And, and severe cardiovascular events. Now, THC is one example. Cannabidiol or CBD is another predominant cannabinoid. 
this cannabinoid actually is just a very weak antagonist of CB1 and CB2, its pharmacology actually is driven by being an allosteric modulator of the cannabinoid receptors. So it affects the affinity of other ligands binding to CB1 by binding to a, a receptor site that's just off-site of that receptor. Cannabigerol or CBG is a weak partial agonist of CB1 and CB2, but it also has direct in, 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 up, inhibition of GABA uptake. Um, cannabinol, which is a degradant of THC, is a partial agonist of CB1 and CB2, but it has less receptor affinity than THC. And then THCV, or tetrahydrocannabivarin, can have differential pharmacology depending on the dose or the concentration in the brain. At low doses, it's an agonist, and at higher doses, it acts as an antagonist. So an antagonist is something that actually binds to the receptor, but prevents any pharmacological action from happening. So in that case, if we think about our cartoon, it can bind to the receptor, but it does not inhibit neurotransmission. But because it's bound to the receptor, anandamide or 2-AG that's released cannot bind to that receptor and inhibit neurotransmission. So there are a number of different ways in which this can impact um, uh, neurobiology. So where are these receptors located? Uh, in the brain, the highest concentrations are in areas that, if you're familiar with the effects of cannabis, make the most sense. So areas uh, affiliated with control of movement, with higher order cognitive functioning, with appetite, learning, memory, and stress, uh, nausea, pain, and uh, vomiting. <clears throat> So knowing that, what are the acute effects of cannabis? If you were to ingest cannabis through any number of uh, methods, uh, this is typically what you would experience under a, a shortly thereafter. So on the positive side of things, you get happy. <laughs> um, you feel relaxed, you laugh a lot more, you get more interested in music, you laugh harder at the movie you're watching. There are potential medical benefits for a variety of health conditions. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the evidence is for that a little bit later. But on the flip side of it, if you don't get your dose right, you can get a drastic increase in your heart rate, your mouth gets really dry, your eyes get red and itchy, um, you get paranoid, you can get anxiety, uh, you can hallucinate, you can throw up. And a lot of people don't know that. They think, oh, it's an anti-emetic. It helps you with vomiting associated with cancer and all that stuff. Well, it's dose-related. And that's important to keep in mind. You also have cognitive impairment, particularly with regards to divided attention, um, working memory, and time estimation. So what is cannabis? I'm talking about cannabis as if everybody knows what it is. So here's some pictures of this plant. Um, and the, the flowers on the plant are what people tend to use that are really highly concentrated with THC <coughs> and all those things that we want to get these drug effects. Now I bring this up because the next slide is going to show you what cannabis is now. It's not just a plant, okay? So with the advent of retail sales of cannabis in over half of the United States, in all of Canada, in a lot of Europe, and in other countries, cannabis isn't just this botanical substance anymore. So we now have things that are being, you still have your, your buds here, you've got your joints, but you also have syringes loaded with extracts of God knows what. We've got uh, bottles of soda. We have highly concentrated extracts that are really high in THC. We've got transdermal patches. We have tinctures that are um, ethanol based that you drop under your tongue. We've got dog treats for your dog that's got arthritic hips. We've got gummy bears. We have suppositories. We have pens that you rub on your skin, uh, vaporizers, bombs, and then there's also this line of pharmaceutical products. And so when we think about medical marijuana or medicinal cannabis, we often forget that there are actually FDA approved products that are uh, synthetic forms of THC or an analog of THC. Those are called Gernabinol, the trade name is Marinol or Sesamet. Um, and then there's also this one in the middle called Sativex. And this is a, um, a plant extract that's approved in Canada and multiple countries 
countries in Europe and Australia, but not in the US. It went under clinical trials, development here, it's kind of stalled out for a number of reasons, um, but they were kind of reinvigorating their program there. So these guys up here tend to pretend that these guys don't exist and vice versa. And it's interesting because when you're thinking about the risk benefit of a, a medicine, of a cannabinoid medicine, it's important to keep both lines in perspective. So now I'm going to switch focus a little bit and talk about what's going on on a nationwide level here. So um, how are things changing? So one, uh, use patterns and attitudes about use are changing. So this is data on adolescent use and attitudes from the Monitoring the Future survey. This is a survey of uh, students in 8th, 10th, and 12th grade that happen every year. And what we can see is starting back here, I know you can't see this, this is 1975 and these are annual dots. All the way up to 2015. So back in the 70s, a lot of people were smoking weed. They didn't think it was very harmful. Then the, uh, the drug laws and, and really push for the, the, dr the drug war kind of ramped up and uh, the use went down and perception of harm went up. This is the just say no era of the Reagan years. And then in 1992, and I'll attribute this to Dr. <laughs> things started switching again. And so we have this increase in use that's remained relatively stable for the last uh, couple decades. Uh, but the perception of harm related associated with use has gone down linearly. And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that it's been legalized as a medicine at, a, at the state level in a bunch of areas. And so the perception is, well, if my grandpa can use it for his arthritis or if my mom and dad use it as uh, for their PTSD or their stress or their anxiety or their ADHD, then it can't be all that bad, right? Well, let's see. We need to think carefully about it. Um, the, around the same time frame here, this one goes back to 1986 we see another trend going upwards in a number of things. So one, the red line here, this is the average um, potency in terms of THC concentration in seized cannabis. So starting again back around the Dr. Dre days, um, people who were uh, uh, sophisticated botanists became interested in applying their trade to their recreational use of cannabis and, and carefully and systematically breeding the plant to increase the levels of THC in it. So when you increase the levels of THC, you basically get more drug per unit of weight that you have in the plant. So you're getting more bang for your buck. Um, along the same lines, you're seeing an increase in the number of people that are seeking treatment for cannabis use disorders. And then you're also seeing here just a slight uptick in the percentage of people that are using cannabis on an annual basis. So there's a, a, an urge to say, wow, look at that. The increase in potency lines right up with an increase in the people that are seeking treatment. Increased potency has got to be the result and driving factor beyond that. You know, the whole talk about this isn't your father's tea, weed and the THC is just astronomical. Um, there's a little bit of data to say that there's some truth to that, but there are a number of factors that also have to go into this. Um, one is around this time is when we shifted from incarceration to drug courts. And when drug courts became popular and, a, and an alternative to arresting people for possession of cannabis, what did they do? They got sent to treatment. And then you go to treatment, and, you, and so there's a sociological factor that goes along with this. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and when you see, and I see a lot of this in the popular media, is that potency is only equal to dose if you consume the same amount. Think of it as akin to alcohol. You have beer, which is usually about five, six, seven percent alcohol. Now with these high double IPAs, it's a little bit more. Then you've got wine, which is usually about 10, 13, 14 percent. <coughs> liquor, which is usually about 40 percent. It's very rare that you go to a bar and you order a pint of vodka. Um, maybe on one vacation. Um, but so what ends up happening is as the, T, the THC potency increases, the users adjust their intake and they use smaller lower amounts but what ends up happening is as you get to these really high potency things especially the extracts like waxes and dabs and shatter um, it becomes hard to titrate your dose because
because the concentration is so high and people will develop a tolerance and they'll get used to those really high doses and that can lead to um, uh, uh, tolerance to withdrawal and things, other things I think a little more rapidly. So what about public perception? Generally, in terms of legalization, we're now uh, only in the past uh, four or five years or so at a point, first time ever, where more people are in favor of fully legalizing cannabis than are against it. And we're seeing that now translate into policy where we now have nine states that have legalized non-medicinal use of cannabis. And a lot of the policy has been driven by the beginning stages where um, uh, groups like Normal and the Drug Policy Alliance and, and similar folks pushed for putting marijuana and, and getting it out there as a medicine and now those same groups are pushing for full legalization for adult use. And where we stand right now is that most states in the U.S. now have some allowance for the medicinal use of cannabis. The ones in green are the ones that have now uh, legalized it for non-medicinal use. And I need to update this because Vermont just passed a law for adult medical use or uh, non-medical use. Here in Kentucky, there's no medical cannabis program, but there's an allowance for a subpopulation of individuals to use cannabidiol or hemp-based medicines. This is typically driven towards uh, children with rare epilepsies um, and maybe other circumstances. Um, so, what are we looking at now from a regulatory perspective? We're looking at claims that in some cases are pretty outlandish, that cannabis cures pretty much everything. Um, we have examples of really egregious um, marketing under that guise. Um, we have concerns about now that the uh, laws against cannabis are, are, are passing, are, are, are being relieved, we, we now are faced with, well, how do we uh, <coughs> do this from a regulatory perspective? How do we deal with the fact that we know from controlled science that it impacts your ability to drive a car well, but we don't have the equivalent of a breathalyzer to determine if somebody's impaired on the roadside? Uh, we do have the problem with um, kind of this uh, explosion of products and this increase in potency we're, and, and in increase in use and availability. We're going to have to deal with the fact that it, people will still develop problems related to this as a drug of abuse. Um, so we need to reconcile all of this stuff. And the need there really speaks to the, the need from a policy perspective of regulatory science centered around cannabis. The same way we have a really broad level of science to inform alcohol policy and regulation and tobacco policy and regulation and pharmaceutical policy and regulation. And so the major questions for cannabis is that we're light years and decades of work behind the policy where it is right now. So it's legally available. It's on the market in the state of Maryland where I live. I can walk into a doctor's office, pay him $50 and say, I got anxiety. And they can say, okay, you can go buy weed. Um, and so we need to know what's an appropriate medical use scenario. Um, what's the comparative evidence efficacy and safety of cannabis versus other potential treatments for that particular health condition? We have no idea the answers to those questions. We need to understand the effects on cognition, performance, development, particularly with, le with adolescent use, um, public health impact of legalization. We really don't know yet whether this is going to end up being a public health benefit or a public health harm. Uh, on one hand, if legalization of cannabis leads a lot of people to quit drinking and start using cannabis responsibly, <coughs> we may be better off from a public health standpoint. But we don't know yet if that's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to increase alcohol and other drug use. There are people that argue both sides, but this is really the first time we've ever rolled out a new drug of abuse widely onto the market with little regulatory control. 
Um, we need to establish procedures for labeling, for dosing, for route of administration, for understanding all of that stuff that can impact for advertising, that's going to impact the rate of use, the rate of problematic use, and how people are going to use, and the likelihood of, um, of adverse consequences. And then we also need to refine our treatments for people who do develop problems related to cannabis use. So cannabis use disorder is real. It's a, a specific diagnosis that can be made um, uh, by a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, and the types of problems that people have related to cannabis use as a drug of abuse are very, very similar. They're essentially the same as what you have for any other drug of abuse. The people that I see in some of my treatment trials um, have just as hard a time quitting use of cannabis as they do for cocaine, for alcohol, for tobacco, um, any other drug of abuse. Their likelihood of success showing up to treatment is the same. Most people fail to quit even though they have all the best reasons and, and good intentions to do so. So, what's the role of psychology in all of this and how can you guys apply your knowledge and your training here to help with this issue? So first is clinical indications, right? So right now, um, in multiple states, cannabis is a, a legal, viable, medicinal option for the treatment of pain, for PTSD, for insomnia, for ADHD, for depression and anxiety, for obsessive compulsive, compulsive disorder, for Tourette's, for autism, uh, agitation and Alzheimer's and the elderly. So these are all areas that are specific to clinical psychology, but, other than this one right here, we've got really no good clinical data on outcomes, on health, uh, on safety, on benefit versus uh, um, risk or harm. Uh, so we need that, and we can get at that a couple of different ways. We can get it through controlled clinical trials. We can get at it through observational research, through case reports. Um, but that's something that needs to be understood. So given this long laundry list, it asks, begs the question, is cannabis a modern cure-all? Is it snake oil? Is it somewhere in between? Now, my take as an objective scientist is it's always somewhere in between. People are going to tell you it cures everything. People are going to say it does nothing, that the medicine is just a, a route to get full legalization for non-medicinal use. And there's some truth to both of those things. I think that there is some risk and harm. I think a lot of the health conditions that people claim it's a beneficial for are just nonsense or it's far inferior to existing um, medications. But there's enough clinical science that indicates that the cannabinoid system and cannabinoids, broadly speaking, have tremendous therapeutic potential. I just don't think cannabis necessarily is the answer. So when we think about what we need um, from a good science perspective to understand whether or not a drug is, is good, we've got to do clinical trials research, right? So cannabis is the only example in modern times where we have um, approved a medicine through legislative means rather than going through traditional FDA drug development. What that usually includes is first understanding what the drug is. We need to understand the pharmacokinetics, bioavailability, and the mechanism of that drug. Then we need to evaluate the safety in humans. We need to establish initial efficacy in placebo-controlled trials, phase two studies. Then we need to look at large efficacy trials and comparative efficacy trials in phase three and a system of post-marketing surveillance. So what do we know about cannabis? Um, Early last year, the National Academies released a report that was a comprehensive, systematic review of everything we know about the clinical impacts of cannabis on a number of health conditions. And they came to these conclusions. Um, there was conclusive and substantial evidence to support clinical use for chronic pain, for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and for nausea or emesis <coughs> therapy. They found moderate evidence to support short-term use for sleep dysfunction. Uh, and they found that it was ineffective for dementia, for glaucoma, or depression associated with pain or multiple sclerosis. And beyond that, there was insufficient evidence to make a determination either way. So to come back, we have a laundry list of state legal um, prescriptions or, or authorized uh, uh, health conditions. 
We only have conclusive and substantial evidence for three. So we need more clinical research to investigate these other things. And, and the timing here is important too. Um, people will often misinterpret or misunderstand the relative risk of using cannabis because of short-term mitigation of symptoms. So it's important that they made a, a determination here, short-term use for sleep dysfunction. Uh, research in my lab has shown that with long-term use, you develop tolerance to the sleep-promoting effects of cannabis. And then when you quit abruptly, the withdrawal exacerbates pre-existing sleep problems and insomnia sets in and is very difficult difficult to manage. So, what are the research limitations that we're facing here? Most of the studies that have been done have been very small. Um, uh, they've been of uh, short duration using a narrow number of doses, a uh, narrow number of routes of administration, and none have been on, conducted on the scale uh, used by FDA for uh, drug approval. So there have been no comparative effectiveness studies. That's key. You need to understand um, how well cannabis is going to control your pain relative to Tylenol, to ibuprofen, to opioids, to NSAIDs, to other types of pain relievers to best be able to judge the relative risk benefit for an individual patient. We have no idea what that is. Um, why do we have such little data? Well, one, it's already legal. It's on the market. Who's going to fund it, right? So there's zero incentive for any company that's legal to produce cannabis or any kind of cannabis products in Colorado to conduct a clinical trial on their product. It costs millions of dollars and they can sell it without it. So we need more funding in this area um, and there are burdensome regulatory requirements. So we have a single source of cannabis for research uh, in the United States. It comes through the federal government. It's great. I use it in my studies, uh, but it doesn't run the whole spectrum of what's available or what we're necessarily interested in. Um, and you have to get a ton of regulatory approvals to do the work. So for every study that I do, I have to get my local IRB to approve the study, then I have to get an IND with the FDA as an experimental new drug, and I have to get the approval from the DEA to run my study. And that's for every single protocol. It goes through three rounds of review. It often takes six months or even longer to get that done. But not to scare anybody else away, there are a number of <coughs> opportunities to get into this business. Um, so I mentioned the growing public support and expanding access. That opens up opportunities for scientists to get engaged in this, whether it's through this burdensome regulatory thing or elsewhere, otherwise. So we have a, a great natural history experiment ongoing. Each state that legalizes cannabis for one purpose or another provides the opportunity to collect data Data. You collect data before the law takes effect, and then you collect it afterwards. And the more people you can collect that data from, the more powerful your study is going to be. That's key, and you can look at a number of different domains. Um, now, with this expanding access, there are funding opportunities, especially at the state level. Uh, in particular, a lot of the states that are now legalizing cannabis for non-medicinal uses are taxing that cannabis and setting aside money for research. Um, California, Colorado, the state of Pennsylvania have dedicated funding streams now to support cannabis science. That's good. We need data. Um, so, clinical and health psychology. Raise your hand if you're interested in clinical health psychology. Anybody here? All right, we got some folks. So, what you guys need to do, we need to look at mental health impacts of cannabis use, right? Good and bad. We need to look at the link with psychosis. So we know that there's a strong correlation between early onset cannabis use and the development of schizophrenia. We don't know if it's causal. We don't know how important it is. We need to understand that. The therapeutic effects of cannabis as the broad whole plant versus individual cannabinoids is important. So ultimately, I think in my mind, the long-term development of, of cannabis, cannabis as a medicine is going to be single molecule, very targeted, very specific medications. You know, in the meantime, we've got this really dirty drug that's a botanical plant that has hundreds of compounds in it. They're very difficult to get a reliable, uh, replicable product out of. 
but we can use information from those products to develop more specific, more targeted products. Um, developmental consequences, health psychology folks. We need to understand early onset use. What's the age limit? Where should we be making recommendations on when people should start using cannabis as a non-medicinal recreational drug? Should it be 21 like alcohol? Should it be later? Could it be earlier? We need to know. Um, experimental psychologists, raise your hands. That's my folks right there. So, yes, um, good controlled lab studies are what we need, and we need a lot of them. So I'm help, happy, happy, happy to discuss this with anybody. Um, email me. I can talk to you through what I do, how I do it. You know, in my lab, and I'll show you a little bit on this coming up, we've got a ton of stuff going on looking at roots of administration, differences in cannabinoid content, um, uh, uh, toxicology, how do you look at driving performance, cognitive impacts, um, a number of areas. Social psychology, marketing, branding, packaging, labeling, uh, social attitudes, risk behavior, the impact of legalization on the black market, is that good or bad? That was one of the driving forces behind opening some of this stuff up, is we would hope to get cr organized crime out the door, kick it back to Mexico. Now, is that going to happen? And is it only going to happen for cannabis? I've been reading recently that while the U.S. domestic production of cannabis has taken a huge chunk out of the cannabis market coming in from Mexico, they're just reinvesting their money in other drugs. They're not going to go away just because you take cannabis away. So what's the impact? What's the global public health impact on all of this? So now I want to talk just a little bit about the work that I'm doing. Now, when I say I'm, it's not just me. I have an army of people that help me do everything that I do. So we try to tackle this from a number of different perspectives. And the types of research questions that we try to ask evolve on an annual basis because those are the questions that come up. When I just try to decide what to do in my lab and what's, what's of interest, it's what are the most pressing needs for regulators and policymakers? What are the most important needs for patients and physicians? And we try to get those big questions and try to do some decent science to answer them and address them. So we look at medications uh, for the help of folks with the treatment of cannabis use disorders. We do human laboratory studies that look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of cannabis through different um, methods. Uh, we're doing observational research registries to try to collect natural history data from people to look at uh, the impact of cannabis laws and cannabis use over time at both the population level and the individual patient level. We do product testing studies to highlight areas that regulators need to focus in on and the need for standards. Um, and I've got a number of collaborations that I'm happy uh, to be involved with where other people are doing outstanding work that I really know nothing about. I just tell them a little bit about cannabis. Um, so I'll walk you through some of what we've done. So in the, in the medications development um, area, the first uh, set of studies I did was looking at dronabinol. So you think back, this is the pharmaceutical um, cannabinoid. It's FDA approved. It's synthetic THC suspended in sesame oil, and it comes in a nice little gel cap, and you can get 2.5 milligram, 5 milligram, or 10 milligram pills. Um, and we were interested in exploring this as a, an agonist pharmacotherapy, so akin to a nicotine patch or a methadone or buprenorphine. Um, so if you can mitigate withdrawal and reduce self-administration, it might help people get over the hump and quit using cannabis. And what we found in our laboratory studies is that we could, in fact, dose-dependently suppress cannabis withdrawal, and we could get people to reduce the number of joints that they smoked, giving free open access to them in, in a laboratory study. Um, and we, we modulated that a little bit um, by making them earn or pay for their joints. Um, but what we were able to show is that high doses in these daily cannabis users could eliminate withdrawal and reduce the amount of cannabis that they would use on a day-to-day -day basis. 
problem is, is a couple of clinical trials that have been done looking at lower doses at this, uh, at about 40 milligrams a day. This is 30 milligrams a day, 60 and 120. So it went pretty high um, because these folks were very tolerant. Um, the clinical trials at lower doses showed that uh, you could get withdrawal suppression, but you didn't get an impact compared with placebo in terms of abstinence. And in order for us to suppress uh, self-administration, we had to go to very high doses, 120 milligrams or 240 milligrams a day. <coughs> and when you think about the, the health benefit, the public health benefit or the risk benefit of going to maintenance on that high a dose of THC in order to reduce withdrawal and, and suppress um, uh, self-administration of smoked cannabis, it wasn't really worth it. Um, people got very intoxicated and they were just ha happy eating their edibles, but it really didn't give them any benefit in terms of getting through their day-to-day -day routine um, in the way that methadone will give you uh, societal benefit by reducing injection, needle sharing, associated burdens of disease and things like that. So the next thing we looked at was Zolpidem. So this is, goes under the trade name of Ambien. We, uh, sleep disruption, as I mentioned before, is a common withdrawal symptom and is one that people often complain of as a big barrier to quitting. So we thought if we can fix people's sleep, maybe it'll help them out. Um, so we demonstrated in a laboratory study um, that if we administered uh, Zolpidem uh, versus placebo, uh, immediately during three days of uh, abrupt abstinence compared to when they were given as much cannabis to smoke as they wanted to, that uh, upon cessation from ad-lib cannabis use, uh, their sleep got worse. It took them a lot longer to get to sleep. They had alterations in sleep architecture. Zolpidem attenuated those effects. We proceeded to a clinical trial, and we see qualitative increases in abstinence um, at any point in time during treatment and in point prevalence compared with placebo. But when we do our statistical analyses of this, it's uh, it's not significant, and there seem to be other factors impacting these differences that we're seeing here. So we're unfortunately at another point where we just don't quite have a, a, a pharmacotherapy that's good for the treatment of cannabis use disorders. So the next uh, uh, series of studies um, that we that I've been doing uh, have been looking at uh, acute dosing in the laboratory with adults who are, are not frequent users. Um, and we're uh, doing this to look at a number of different things. We're looking at, well, what are the dose effects across different routes of administration? So what's an appropriate unit dose if you eat it, smoke it, or vape it? Um, what are the impacts of uh, constituents? Uh, how, do, how do biomarkers tell us about impairment? Um, and so we've looked at these kinds of things across multiple studies. We've done a passive exposure study, an oral dosing study, a vapor uh, study, and a smoke study. And we use uh, cannabis that's high in THC, and we obtain it from the federal government. And we do placebo, 10 milligram, 25, and 50 milligrams of THC. Now, the 50 milligram dose was only in our brownie study, and we dropped it from our inhalation study because it didn't show much of a difference uh, between from the 25 milligram dose. So again, it's a partial agonist. So we could go really, really high and not see a big difference in our outcome measures. Um, and so the assessments that we look at here is we collect bio, uh, blood, saliva, and urine from folks. We collect subjective ratings of drug effects, and we do a cognitive performance battery and collect vital signs. Um, I'm going to skip this because it's not terribly important. So to the end of our, our first study is can I get a contact eye? This is our passive exposure study. So going back to the slide here, um, this is a, a big plexiglass chamber where we uh, essentially clam baked a bunch of folks. Um, we gave six people ten joints to smoke in an hour, and then we put six other people that don't use cannabis to sit next to those six folks. <laughs> And we, we uh, had them just sit there and see yeah, what happens. And so the answer is that if we eliminate all airflow through the chamber and we give them high potency, uh, about 11, 12% THC cannabis, um, the folks that are smoking, hey, they get high. Um, and their blood THC levels go up concordantly and we get a really nice correlation between drug effects and blood THC levels. Um, and 
if we do the same thing over here with the non-smokers, if we allow air, throw, air flow through uh, the chamber, they don't get high and we don't see any THC in their blood. But if we shut off the, the room circulation, they get a little high and we see some THC in their blood. We also see it in their urine. We also saw it in their saliva. And they felt a little bit impaired. Um, now, I want to point out two things. With respect to blood, the smokers, having not smoked yet, had a blood level of about 4 nanograms per ml of THC. These guys, at the max, when they're feeling a drug effect, these guys were not feeling a drug effect, um, they've, got a, they've got about the same amount of THC in their blood. I'm going to come back to that. So, in the next couple studies, we did oral smoked and vaporization. I'm going to show you data from 10 and 25 milligram THC doses. Uh, when we ask people, how high did you get? Well, um, if they inhale it, vaporization was, was delivering a stronger drug effect than smoking. And if inhalation, the drug effect is immediate peak drug effect and then a very slow return to baseline. When you eat it, you have a slower onset of the drug effect and you don't get the peak drug effect until about two, one and a half, two hours after you eat it. But the peak drug effect is about the same as what it is for smoke. And you're gonna see that pattern across these subsequent uh, slides. So this shows pleasant effect. So generally at 10 milligrams, they like it. It's still <coughs> 10 milligrams, but not as much. And it's because you still get some, you start to get side effects to high dose. So not really much here, but again, a little bit more with vaporization. And the time course remains the same. So what types of adverse events are we talking about here? Feeling anxious and nervous? Um, are, in generally, across these studies, are higher doses produced anxiety, uh, irritability, uh, feeling that their heart was racing, sleepy and tired, hungry and having the munchies, um, sick, restless, and decreased feelings of alert. We had uh, four individuals vomit at the 25 or 50 milligram doses. We had two people have panic attacks at those doses. Okay, One person hallucinated. Now these are doses that are easy to get from a dispensary. So we have to be careful with our packaging and our doses and how we recommend people use cannabis for medicinal purposes. Um, we saw dose-related impairment on cognitive functioning. So this is a, a divided attention task. You can see at a 25 milligram dose, we're getting a, a big change from baseline. Higher means worse performance on this. This is a tracking task. Um, here's a working memory task. Again, not really much change um, at the 10 milligram dose, but 25 milligrams, we had a huge drop. Uh, drop with, with vaporization of uh, 20, a mean of 23 correct on an item where the total correct, possible correct is 90. Um, and on this task, people literally just have to add single integers in a serial manner. So what's two plus four? It's six. What's four plus three? It's seven. And they do that on a repeat basis. Um, this is a psychomotor performance task. Again, not much happening at 10 milligrams except with vaporization. 25 milligrams, we get impaired performance on the ability to type a three symbol pattern on the keyboard. Now, how does the drug effect relate to blood? And this is coming back to the couple things that I highlighted on, on our passive exposure study. So this is the figure you already saw about drug effect at the 25 milligram dose. Here's blood effects. So again, higher THC with vaporization versus oral, that corresponds with the difference here. What's drastically different is the blood THC levels after you eat cannabis. It's way lower, and our peak effect here, our peak level is two nanograms per milliliter in blood, which is what our heavy smokers were before they got high in the other study, and is also the same as our passively exposed individuals. These guys here, were vomiting, having anxiety reactions, and were severely impaired on our cognitive performance outcomes. So this is important, and I point this out, coming back to that roadside drugged driving stuff. 
Love THC cannot tell you anything about whether an individual is impaired or not. And that's important. And that's an issue that a lot of the states are struggling with, and now Canada as a country is struggling with, because they're legalizing Canada, uh, cannabis nationwide this summer. Um, so, and interestingly, again, this is uh, saliva. There's no difference at all. And it's not metabolism that's accounting for these changes. And when we look at correlations between um, the blood levels of either THC or its metabolites or uh, saliva THC, it's, it, we really only get significant correlations uh, with subjective drug effect and performance indices for vaporization, but these are not really strong. They're statistically significant, but a, a point two is not going to be usable roadside. I'm running low on time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here. We do see sex differences, okay? Um, females tend to be more sensitive to cannabis effects than men. We don't adjust for body weight or BMI in our dosing. I think that that might be driving it, but there's also some neurobiological uh, studies that have shown that the endocannabinoid system is expressed differently in females than males. We're doing more research on that um, in a collaboration with my colleague Elise Wirtz to try to understand that and look at CB1 receptor density cross sexes. Um, limitations to keep in mind with this is that we used infrequent cannabis users in these acute dosing studies. Um, tolerance can play an impact. We also only used high THC, low CBD cannabis. We're flipping that in a study that we're about to start, so we're going to start looking at that as well. Um, now, I mentioned observational research a little bit. I think this is somewhere where we can really get big data to inform risk benefit, especially in medicinal use. Um, I've been lucky enough to partner with a nonprofit organization in Colorado called the Realm of Caring Foundation. They have a large patient registry. They reach out to their patients and ask them to complete surveys for us. We've um, started looking at data. This is a fairly new thing, but we have over a thousand people who've um, completed the survey at base baseline now and we're doing follow-ups every three months with these folks to look at changes over time. But what we look at um, is people who are using cannabis compared to um, uh, folks who are not using cannabis. And that's it, very crude comparison, uh, but in a large number of people, we start to see that the folks that are using cannabis, these are very sick, <coughs> variety of health problems, um, but very sick, um, and tend to be using more hemp, oil, and, and CBD-based products. Um, we see an improvement in quality of life, in health satisfaction, improved pain, improved sleep, less anxiety, less depression, compared to the same types of people in the same registry who have not who are interested in using cannabis but have not yet started it. Then, when we look specific to a certain health condition, autism is one, we see this generally the same pattern. Uh, when we look at ep epilepsy, we see the same thing. Now, we've looked at recently a subset of individuals with epilepsy who at baseline were not using cannabis but then initiated prior to a follow-up. And so in the same individuals, compared to when they were not using cannabis, they started using it and a couple months later, we're seeing improvements in their self-reported satisfaction with their health. We're seeing improvements if you're a child in their sleep and we're seeing reduction in depression and the number of prescriptions medications that they're taking. Those are positive trends. This is something that we need to look more into in terms of impact. And then the last little bit I'm going to talk about in terms of things that I'm interested in doing is evaluating the actual products that are on the shelf being sold in dispensaries. So the first study we did here looked at the label accuracy of the dose of cannabis or THC um, in products being sold in California and Washington State. We did this a couple years ago. We sent in a, a, you know, a mystery shopper type person, bought a bunch of different things on the shelves, took it to an analytical lab. We said, all right, the label says this has this much THC in it. We're going to run it through our uh, uh, GCMS, or uh, uh, sorry, an HPLC. We're going to analyze the actual T THC content of this entire thing, not expecting it to be homogenized in the product, which it wasn't. Um, and we found that most of the products were mislabeled. 
Um, we did the same thing with hemp oil products or cannabidiol products that you can purchase over the internet. Um, we bought every product that you could buy over the internet, had it all shipped to a lab. They ran through testing um, and found that 26% uh, had less cannabidiol than what was labeled. A quarter of them also had THC, which was not labeled at all. And there was a huge variation in concentration across products. Everything from as little as one milligram per milliliter of solution to 800 milligrams per milliliter of solution. So if you're a, 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 a parent of a child with, with epilepsy and you're trying to think, wow, they're all the same, right? Which one do I pick? They're not all the same. And you can't necessarily trust what it says that they're selling you. So that's my long-winded way of saying, we need more people doing this stuff. And so my hope is that this helps kind of people <coughs> thinking about kinds of things, interesting science that could be done, interest in this area. Um, there's a lot that needs to be done. Uh, there is funding available. It's exciting, fun science that actually is relevant to the current policy decision making right now. It's very rare in science that you actually get to do something that can have an impact. This stuff can. So um, with that, I will thank everybody for the patience, for staying awake, um, and also all of my collaborators and folks for which I can't do what I'm doing. So thanks. So, um, yeah, so if anybody didn't hear, the question is uh, studies looking at IQ and cognitive performance pre and post cannabis use. So um, that's a tricky one. So in most studies that have been done, uh, evaluation of an individual has not happened before they initiate cannabis. What you tend to do is you have large samples of cannabis users compared to non-cannabis users, or cannabis users compared to non-users and former users. And so what they try to tease apart there is, um, is there an impact of cannabis use on IQ, on cognitive functioning? Does it resolve if you quit? And the, the science is okay right now on, on, on that level. Um, and what, it, what we know is that cannabis users, when you try to match and control for a bunch of other things as best you can, tend to do a little bit worse on cognitive functioning compared with non-users or former users. Um, the consensus right now is that acute long-term use of cannabis harms your cognitive functioning. If you quit, it looks like you can mostly resolve those problems. Um, there are a number of studies that are ongoing, kind of just getting started, that are going to really help delineate all of that. The big one is the ABCT study, which is an NIH-funded uh, project that's a longitudinal study that starts with uh, kids. Uh, I, think about the age of 12 or 13, pre-drug use, it involves a comprehensive uh, neuropsychological battery as well as neuro brain imaging, functional brain imaging, and they're gonna follow this cohort of, uh, I think 10,000 kids or something over many years. So that's the, the really detailed data that we're gonna need to really get to the bottom of that. Yes? Uh, no, we usually run a couple people at a time. We try to pair people up one or two. Um, it's not a social party kind of thing, and we keep the people very busy um, doing our assessments, especially for the first couple hours, because we need to try to track and capture that change as it happens. Um, but you're, they're not isolated, but it's also not a party. Well, one of them started like, in the higher doses, if they like, started drinking out, the other person no, we don't see a lot of that. And aside from the smoked root of administration, we also don't see much of a placebo response, which is good. And it, it, and it, it, it makes sense with the smoking that we would get a higher placebo response because there are a lot of sensory kind of cues associated with the ritual of smoking a joint or a bowl that 
kind of give you a little bit of a drug effect. Um, but with vaporization and with oral administration, we really saw no placebo effect, and we didn't see really any cross-participant contamination in terms of adverse consequences or overall drug effect level. Yeah. How does uh, has the schedule has it being a schedule one drug has that affected the availability of research for these? So the question is, how important is the schedule one designation on research? It's very important. So it's a whole extra level of um, regulatory uh, requirement. Um, so for example, just storage of the drug, the DEA comes in and has to make absolutely sure that the five grams of cannabis that I order for a study doesn't walk away, um, which is kind of insane, but we have a completely secure building. Inside of our secure building, you have to have key card access to get through a couple corridors to a key card restricted pharmacy that only three people have access to, and inside that is a giant bank vault. So <laughs> it's a little above and beyond what probably is required, but that's essentially what you have to do. You have to have, at a bare minimum, very restricted access to the drug to a couple individuals. They do background checks on those individuals, and it has to be in a secured safe that's either bolted to the ground or built into the wall. Um, and then again, um, different from other drugs, because it's a Schedule One drug, every single study we propose to do, the DEA has to review that particular protocol and say, oh, yep, it's okay, or not. Um, which doesn't make sense because each study is just that we're not changing how we store the drug, we're not changing what we're doing to it or any risk of diversion, but it's an extra layer of, of burden. And we can't even send our protocols to DEA until after we have every other regulatory approval in place. And then they usually sit on it for a couple months and then they'll tell you, oh, okay. <laughs> so it, it's it's challenging and you know but but at the same time they have regulations that they have to enforce um, the folks that I've spoken to at the DEA are sympathetic to our position um, they try to help us the way the best <coughs> from my perspective but it's still in my mind a little unnecessary to have to send every single protocol to them when nothing from a risk of diversion perspective changes yeah how did you make sure that the frequent cannabis users did not like smoke before they got there? Like, did you have like certain tests that you would do or give them like certain rules that they would need to follow so as to not interfere with your results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually we enforce like a, an overnight abstinence prior to coming in. We bring people in really early in the morning. Now there are some folks that will get up and smoke cannabis first thing, but we do some uh, some biological testing. We look at breath CO, we look at um, uh, urine toxicology tests from their screening visit to, to when they come in, um, and then we can just do an, a general evaluation, look and make sure their eyes aren't bloodshot, make sure that they're communicating well and not looking impaired in any way. Um, and then when you see the jump in the blood levels and in their impairment, and in their drug effect ratings, as soon as you dose them, then you feel pretty confident that they didn't dose right before they got there. Yeah? Uh, how much has the opioid crisis played a role in motivating cannabis based research so far? Uh, for me, none. Um, but I think that that's an important question. So the question for everybody is how much is the opioid crisis and problem driving interest in, in driving cannabis research? I think um, it's an important question and something, again, talking about the global public health of legalization, that that's going to be key to evaluate. Um, so a, a couple colleagues of mine are interested in, in looking at this, whether or not cannabis can uh, either supplement uh, uh, opioid use or replace opioid use in pain management. Now the research on cannabis as an analgesic is complicated in that um, most are really short duration studies and uh, a lot of the, the outcomes are really mixed as, tar in, as far as its e efficacy as an analgesic. The best signal is in neuropathic pain. So not all pain is the same. Um, the post-operative pain evaluations actually suggest cannabis isn't very good as an analgesic for post-op pain. Uh, so it really depends on the source of pain, the type of pain, depends on a little bit where whether you can combine the two. So there's a lot of preclinical data that suggests
suggests you can get synergistic pain relief when you combine lower doses of an opioid and a cannabinoid versus using high doses of either one. And so if we can lower the doses, we might reduce tolerance, we might reduce a lot of the adverse effects of either, but get comparable or even better pain relief. And so uh, uh, two of my colleagues at Hopkins are doing lab studies looking at combinations right now. Uh, a guy by the name of Mark, Mark Ware at McGill University in, in Canada is doing outstanding work looking at transitioning pain patients, long-term chronic pain patients from opioids to cannabis um, and showing <coughs> there. So again, we're gonna need more research, but if you can demonstrate equal efficacy from a, um, a therapeutic perspective, um, I think the risks of opioids far uh, outweighs the risks of, of cannabinoids from what we can tell. Um, but again, long-term use is another interesting thing because with opioids, short-term use is great. It's when it's long-term maintenance on the opioids that you have a lot of problems because people develop tolerance, they have to escalate their doses. That increases adverse effects and risk of overdose and diversion and all that kind of stuff. There is a hand in the far back. Shout! Be the last question. Go for it. So um, all of my research is done under FDA approval. Um, so anything that's been done, acute cannabis dosing, we all have INDs, which is investigational new drug approvals to conduct science and research. Those can be had. The key there and the trick there is that the product itself has to be well characterized and has to meet certain chemistry and manufacturing uh, requirements. And that's an important distinction. So in order to get an FDA IND, you have to demonstrate that your product is safe, it has a known toxicology, um, it's made with good manufacturing practices, um, and, and it's replicable. So that one dose is gonna be the same as the next dose and the next dose, and one batch is the same as the next and the next. And in order to do that, it costs money and development. That comes back to where none of the companies that are selling their uh, their wares in cannabis dispensaries at the state level have gone through the process of really getting their manufacturing fine-tuned and established enough to get an IND from the FDA. Um, there are also regulatory problems there where DEA comes in and they're maybe not allowed to do that. So it's problematic from, from a number of perspectives. So there's a common uh, complaint that the cannabis I get from the National Institute on Drug Abuse isn't representative of all of the cannabis that's out there being sold and used by patients. That is true, but the advantage is the cannabis I get from NIDA I know is reliable. We get really nice dose effects. It's consistent from one batch to the next to the next, from one patient to the next to the next. Um, given my dose of uh, label evaluation studies, I can't trust what I get off the shelf uh, in a dispensary yet. And so I'm looking forward to some companies making that jump and, and offering alternatives. So thank you guys. Um, anybody else who has other questions and didn't want to shout it out, I'll be hanging around for a little bit. Come up and talk to me.